Thank you, Nick, for introduction, and um, thank I thank uh, organizer for inviting me, and I also thank them for having the talk in the afternoon, not in the morning. Coming from West, sometimes I feel like I'm talking in the middle of the night. Um, Hopefully I can give you some perspective on uh, therapeutic drug monitoring of biologic drugs that are uh, unique consideration for um, uh, in terms of measuring that, what other some consideration when developing such assays. So. Okay. Uh, what are biopharmaceuticals? Um, in comparison to the traditional medicine, uh, biopharmaceuticals are protein-based drugs. Um, you can tell right off the bat the sheer size of differences are two to three orders of magnitude different. Um, in general, they tend to be uh, less stable. Um, you know, in the past, uh, some hormone replacements like insulin or growth hormones been uh, harvested directly from tissue. Uh, Many years ago, uh, insulin was, you know, harvested from uh, pig pancreas. Uh, growth hormone was uh, harvested from uh, human cadavers. Um, now, with the advent of biotechnology, um, these uh, biopharmaceuticals are uh, being produced in a um, cellular system. Um, we're very sophisticated now with uh, being able to engineer specifically and um, targeting, you know, being able to modify not only the um, endogenous hormones, but to be able to make it last longer, more stable, and highly targeted and specific. So if you look at um, blockbuster drugs by revenue, all the red ones are shown, or uh, red ones are biologics, um, that worldwide, uh, four out of five top uh, drugs that are being sold are uh, biopharmaceuticals. Um, these protein drugs are the fastest growing and they will continue to grow uh, as they make up a large fraction of R&D pipeline of the uh, pharmaceutical companies. Um, one of the pop, the reason for such a popularity is that the, uh, they have a lower rate of um, a drug failure, uh, greater on target efficacy, and uh, risk of toxicities uh, lower. However, the therapeutic proteins um, are, they can, one of the problems with the therapeutic proteins are they can elicit immune responses. So patients eventually develop uh, anti-drug antibodies, and that could mean that it could alter pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic responses to these drugs. So. Currently, there are a lot of drugs out there um, being produced, but really for needs to be able to monitor these drugs accurately and to help clinician is, uh, that need is not being met. So what are some of the immunogenicity risk factors? It starts from the start of the structure of the protein itself. Um, if you typically, the more, uh, more similar the drug is to the endogenous protein, they tend to be less antigenic. So if you look at, um, you know, porcine insulin versus the, you know, human insulin, they tend to be more antigenic. Um, also, the expression pattern is very important in terms of how it could elicit immunogenic response. Um, some of the expression system that could add uh, post-translational modification uh, can make a big impact. Um, even manufacturing process where uh, because the protein drugs in t tend to be less stable, uh, they could uh, lose its three-dimensional structure, it could aggregate, it could, uh, you know, become oxidized. Um, so really the manufacturing process is also very important in developing protein drugs. Um, another factor that could uh, have an impact on immunogenicity is the root of administration. Uh, subcutaneous uh, uh, administration is, you know, different than IV infusion. Also, uh, you know, another area where 
pharmaceutical company try to administer is through inhalation and um, nasal, through nasal route. Uh, we where were the CRO lab that provided um, immunogenicity testing for um, exubra study for Pfizer, um, and inhale, inhalation produced little more immunogenic response than uh, sub-Q um, sub uh, administration. Also, the dose impacts how much the drug is infused, as well as the frequency of um, uh, test frequency of the administration. Um, even analytically, um, there are depending on the assay design, um, one could have you know insufficient sensitivity to the assay. Uh, some assays have a lot of drug interference, so it could produce falsely low results. Which, which could also add a lot of confusion. Um, also, the uh, immunogenicity really is a patient dependent, depending on a uh, patient's uh, immunologic status as disease status. Some patients, if you have autoimmune disease, you are, that patient is much more um, likely to develop uh, autoantibodies to these drugs. Um, in terms of a therapeutic standpoint, um, anti-drug antibody impacts really the level of bio actionable drug level. Um, another consideration is that the infusion can cause more like an allergic type of reaction. Um, also, basically overall uh, diminishes the overall treatment response. So in terms of types of Antibodies, auto antibodies to the drugs, there are basically falls into three categories. Um, majority of the patients develop antibody that just simply binds to the drug. Uh, many may not have any impact on therapeutic action, but it may have impact on clearance. Uh, they may be expressed transiently, um, but uh, or it may uh, act sort of as a binding protein that delays the um, clearance. The neutralizing antibody um, are usually t uh, impacts therapeutic action where, where it enhances the uh, clearance and um, usually the sign of mature response to the um, treatment that's been ongoing. And then there are more like allergic type of response where hypersensitivity occurs uh, against the drug and um, that, that, that could be mild form of response as a you know, rash on a skin to anaphylaxis type of serious response. So these are kind of the strategy that pharmaceutical company uh, takes uh, when they are um, during the uh, drug development. Typically, uh, they're interested in um, looking at the immunologic response that are uh, they take this strategy where they're looking at basically screen, screening assay where they're uh, measuring binding assays and then once of the positive uh, fraction of that, uh, well, they will screen for bioassay to uh, see if they're having a neutralizing um, uh, response, re neutralizing capacity. Then from there, um, they further analyze uh, antibody, type of antibodies that are, you know, is that isotype type of response, really looking at um, uh, toxicity uh, of the uh, antibody that could potentially have it on patients. So all these type of um, uh, analysis are often asked by the FDA before uh, drug launching. So in terms of measuring antibodies, there are many, many different forms. Um, over the years, we have develop these assays on many different type of platforms. Uh, for ears, we use uh, insulin uh, uh, immunogenicity antibody assay using radioisotope. It was very cleanly done. Uh, just because some technique is old doesn't mean it's not high quality. But um, really, I don't think the platform matters so much. It really, if you want to develop really high performance, good quality assay could be developed on any platform. 
really the assay design and the chemistry is really important. Um, so I just want to go over kind of the highlight. I mean, these are, I'm only showing this insulin drug assay. Uh, even though it's measured on many different platforms, it's a common assay, we still don't measure insulin drug correctly in the clinic. Uh, it's because uh, insulin analogs are slightly different. Um, if you rely on immunoassay to detect insulin analogs, there are varying degree of cross-reactivity. So there's a lot of confusion in the, uh, in the clinic. When they measure uh, patient insulin levels, if patients are taking insulin, some assays don't measure insulin at all. Uh, some assay cross-react 100%. Really, a lot of the provider of the uh, insulin assay platform needs to do more of these testing to provide the cross-reactivity of different insulin that are being uh, made. So, um, so that the lab that provides such a testing um, can tell, uh, help clinician interpret basically what, the, what that means. The anti-insulin assay that we're currently using and um, have used for the, uh, the clinical trials was uh, using a uh, radioisotope label um, insulin. Basically, the assay uh, is designed to use the radio label insulin as sort of a bait to capture anti-drug uh, antibody that's against, produced against insulin. One of the important things to remember is that with all uh, anti-drug assay, that you need a, some way to uh, clear away the drug that are being present. So if you could imagine here, Basically, you, you are using insulin to trap a patient's antibody. Therefore, if you have insulin on board, it will compete with your um, signal, uh, your bait, so that you're going to produce a um, uh, basically falsely negative result. It's very, very common in a lot of those um, assays where uh, that, um, that the test that most tests out there for um, immunogenicity tests are, they're not very good at doing that piece. And so the way we overcome, uh, or our assay protocol is you acid dissociate patient samples, and then basically charcoal absorb the uh, insulin on board, then take the, uh, pay, uh, basically the insulin cleared patient sample, then you do the um, reaction with the uh, radio label insulin. And then the confirmatory test would be to add excess. Um, after the extraction step, you add uh, excess unlabeled insulin to compete out and look for signal disappearance. So really, there are a lot of challenges to developing a uh, robust um, anti-drug assay, ADA assay. Uh, first of all, there's really no um, reference standard for quantification. Um, you know, unlike other markers, um, there is, you know, then the parent, the patients produce antibodies that are polyclonal in general. So, in the beginning of the assay development, often you're using surrogate uh, polyclonal antibody as a standard curve. Um, and eventually with more, pa you know, if you are lucky enough to be able to have uh, patient samples that with the positive antibodies, then you end up pooling patient samples and characterizing that, and, um, and that's how this, a lot of the quantification, quantitation is done. And typically, the antibody assays are semi-quantitative at best. Um, even if you had a reference standard curve, um, you know, the, everybody, because everybody produces different polyclonal antibodies, uh, they don't seem to, um, you know, often it, it doesn't uh, dilute linearly. So, um, and another important thing, as I said, mentioned with the insulin, um, some, you really need to overcome a way to um, remove uh, drugs on board, otherwise, you're going to produce uh, falsely low results. 
So with monoclonal antibodies, really this is one of the typical ways. Uh, it's a bridging assay format. Their uh, monoclonal antibody binds in a divalent fashion. So this is very uh, popular way to measure uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and then talk about um, the monoclonal antibody therapy that are being employed in inflammatory bowel disease. Um, it's very important to understand what the, what the drug is used for and what uh, disease class so that, you know, LabCorp is a, a service provider, so we interact with, we provide basically result to clinician, so we need to understand how it's being used, how, how our test is going to be used in the clinic. So um, one of the first things when we develop assays to really categorize how, who are we marketing these tests to and, you know, how is it going to be used. So, um, you know, IBD is not to be confused with um, irritable bowel disease, they're a different disease. These are, IBD is a autoimmune disease. Um, incidence is uh, increasing worldwide, um, like Peter said. The, um, you know, is patients have genetic predisposition and it's basically dysregulated immune response to some sort of external factor. Um, this disease is a fairly uh, serious disease where it, it impacts, starts at younger age um, and uh, it's serious enough that people are, you know, once when once they have these flares, uh, um, they are typically very. It's a very dis disabling disease where you can become even hospitalized. So the quality of life is impacted, and cost of care is also. So um, there are so the the treatment tools in um, IBDs are uh, you know mild to severe, where it end up being even having a surgery. So by the time the patient is treated with the biologics, um, they're in a, a pretty severe uh, state of the um, disease where it needs treatment. So what are some of the uh, biologics that are uh, used in IBD? All these um, three drugs, uh, mentioned are targeting TNF-alpha, and the reason for TNF, uh, targeting TNF-alpha is the, the central key player uh, in eliciting immune response. So the, the, the most popular uh, and first line of biologic that's being employed is, um, is infliximab, and it's a chimeric, a mouse, and a uh, human um, monoclonal antibodies, and the, depending on the structure of the uh, monoclonals, um, the immunogenicity, level of immunogenicity uh, is higher with the mouse monoclonal than something that looks more, uh, it's more humanized. So you could also tell um, the naming convention. When it's chimeric, it's usually with the XIMM, and when it's fully humanized is, so adalumumab, and then partially human, uh, um, you know, mostly humanized is zumab. So with all these drugs, they're all targeting uh, TNF-alpha, uh, uh, the immune response pathway. So the side effects of these drugs are, uh, you know, infection, and in treatment response, treatment uh, consideration-wise, the immunogenicity. So we developed our assay on MSD platform, um, partially because we had some expertise using this technology, but um, you can, you know, build these kind of assays on any platform. I've seen assays, the very good assays on ELISA as well as, um, you know, other platforms. So if you're not familiar, basically the MSC technology is a microtiter plate that is carbon coated. So you could add, uh, you could apply a lot more capture. Uh, antigen or antibody, um, it gives you wider dynamic range, uh, and one of the hallmarks of their technology is that the, the background tend to be fairly low, um, as uh, when you do the reaction, only um, 
uh, res the signal uh, signal uh, is um, only counted uh, when the um, the initiation of the whole reaction is uh, elicited by electrochemiluminescent signal. So unlike um, ELISA, uh, even, even, even if the free uh, conjugate is not washed off completely, it will give you a count. Only thing that is making a, uh, these near uh, the electro, the bottom of the plate basically gives you the signal. So um, because the drug binds to TNF-alpha. Um, we basically have a stacking assay design where it's a multiple sequential step where uh, TNF-alpha is used to capture TNF, uh, drug binds to TNF, and then we have antibody against uh, anti-TNF-alpha. So that's how it's done. Um, it's basically like two-site sandwich type of assay. Uh, I've seen assay develop where they use the mass spec. Um, that might not serve uh, clinically well because mass spec method, they were basically measuring uh, antibody bound as well as antibody unbound method because they're measuring everything. Uh, what's important here is that there are um, a lot of patients, about, roughly about 50% of the patients develop antibodies to the drug. So what you want to measure is antibody unbound fraction of the uh, infleximab. The drug design is we uh, pre-treat, uh, pre-treatment step in inactivates the, the drugs. And uh, in a solution phase, we add patients uh, antibodies to um, the drug that is conjugated to infleximab, which this PC gives you the signal. Uh, the biotin conjugated in Fleximab, it binds, sandwiches the um, anti-drug antibody in a divalent fashion, and then the whole thing gets uh, captured on streptavidin plate. So here, the key is not so much the strategy, but really the, our um, secret sauce, if you will, is uh, ability to separate drug out before we do this. Um, reaction. So this curve tells you that if you don't pretreat in the presence of drug, the signal drops out immediately. What, what the pretreatment, uh, you can recover 100% of antibody in there, regardless of how much the uh, drug is being is been present. So this really allows. Uh, that, uh, that you, you don't need to stop treatment in order to measure um, antibodies. And really stopping the therapy to measure antibody level is really not an option in, um, in, in, the, in, in clinics. So one other thing that we have done was uh, the drug maker of infleximab is Jensen. Uh, they wanted to do international method comparison studies. So there were um, participants from you know, U.S. participant was LabCorp, and there were, for, you know, several European and Canadian participants. Um, what they wanted to do was really, with all the commercial assays out there, uh, you know, can, are the methods, you know, comparable, reliable, uh, being able to measure drug level as well as the um, anti-infleximab antibodies. So blinded samples were distributed to the study participant, and they assess uh, specificity, selectivity, accuracy, precision, and correlation to Jensen studies. Um, basically, most assays were specific for infleximab. Um, you know, if they added another um, anti-TNF drugs, it didn't cross-react. Uh, accuracy were pretty comparable, but the selectivity of um, antibody in the presence of drug was variable. A lot of assays were not able to measure uh, antibody levels accurately in the presence of drug. Um, we were very excited with the results because we correlated. We, we performed very well. Our assay performed very well. Uh, and really, uh, it, it correlated best with the uh, um, uh, Jensen developed 
methods that was used in clinical studies. So what this means is that you know our assay, we could use our assay to um, take a benefit of what the clinical outcome of the Jensen clinical trials. So uh, what the what Jensen study is, this is our typical um, treatment where patients are, uh, you know, it's divided into two where induction phase where the uh, administration of the drug is at, um, at five milligrams per kilogram at uh, week zero, two, and six, um, and then maintenance dose at every uh, eight weeks. And if the patient doesn't respond, uh, dose is el escalated to 10 milligrams a kilogra uh, kilogram weight. Or, you, you know, so you could shorten the drug dosing interval um, when there isn't a response. And so the expected range is in the induction phase is the serum infleximab should hit, you know, 20 to 10. And then, and then when you are in, um, uh, in a response phase or maintenance phase, at least minimum of uh, 3.5 was the mean dose that um, at a trough level, that's what you should be um, measuring, hitting. So they did another uh, study where, um, you know, the higher concentration of the maintenance dose was shown to be more effective. Uh, combination therapy with the immunomodulator also give it a um, you know better response, partly because these patients develop less likely to de uh, develop autoantibodies. Um, so really to guide therapy, uh, their minimum dose of the drug should be, uh, you know, drug level should be met, and um, you know, the less antibody present, the better. Um, so what the, the summary of the, a study outcome was that the schedule and sustained dosing is very important. Uh, measuring uh, serum trough level of the drug and antibody is important because, uh, you know, whether to keep patient on continued therapy or increase or decrease the dosing, basically treat treatment optimization uh, you can do by testing patient sample and, um, you know, co-therapy with uh, other immunomodulators seem to be superior than just doing a monotherapy. Um, you know, the long-term use of, use of biologic seems to be safe, uh, reinitiating therapy after, you know, long drug holiday uh, seem to be also safe and effective. So uh, we're very excited to be able to use these type of finding with our assay. And um, when our assay hit the clinic, um, and we thought we had a very good assay, very clear assay, we were very excited and launched it. And, um, and not everybody's following, they're basically chaos in clinic, and that's what's to be expected often. Um, the, the level of uh, physician sophistication varies so much. Some uh, physicians are on top of everything. They know exactly how to interpret the test, what to do. And there are physicians who are really uneducated. Um, so really not everybody was following the protocol. Nobody, they were not doing the test administration following you know, what the drug maker have found. So partly it's driven by a physician. Another times, partly patient compliance. They don't want, you know, they skip, they don't, they feel better, so they would stop. The cost of the drug is enormously expensive, so uh, that's another consideration. A lot of times, a uh, clinician says, I don't really want the test, I'm just going to treat empirically. If the patient feels better, I continue on, and if the patient doesn't feel better, then I will stop. Um, so. And then all, another thing the clinicians were doing was they're basically testing to verify if the response failed, if the drug is working or not. Instead of really monitoring it beginning to see how can I optimize treatment, they were basically verifying when things didn't work. So another thing that was happening was that the 
test was not being interpreted correctly. So uh, as soon as they get even small level of positive antibody, they were quitting the treatment despite having an optimal drug level and patients are responding. So they were worried about, oh, because my patient has positive antibody, maybe they're going to develop some hypersensitivity in the future. So basically, there were lack of treatment optimization. I mean, you, you, with the test, you could really optimize a patient's therapy, but that's not what's happening. So, you know, after offering the assay for a couple of years, and we're still offering it, but we're putting, you know, with the data that, that we have, um, we're trying to uh, make our test a little more clear. What can we do? We need to put a lot more effort in uh, a client education. So these are some of the, uh, you know, I'm in the process of analyzing our data. So this is the drug level. So um, we looked at, um, you know, if, if I look at the whole, um, you know, antibody measurements, starting with antibody, half of the patients uh, ha are antibody negative and half the patient have positive antibodies. And really, the level that you want to hit is above 3.5. Um, there are patients who are 10% of the patient do not have, you know, they have undetectable drug level despite not having any antibodies. But the, the, all the data are coming from a wide variety of uh, conditions. Not everyone is drawing sample at trough, so um, it is to be expected. Uh, but for the majority of the patients, they are hitting the optimal level of the treatment, and there are some that are uh, hitting a lot higher levels, and then there are you know, small, but uh, some percentage of the patients are receiving scary high level, but I also think that maybe there's a dryer, maybe they're drying it at the arm that they're infusing blood from, so um, I don't know for sure, but there are small fraction where the levels are very, very high. And then if I look at um, the, the antibody positive samples that are a little more interesting, um, uh, like I said before, about 50% of the patients have positive antibodies. So if I look at antibody negative fraction where they are actually having, uh, if I average antibody negative patient with uh, drug levels up to 30, the mean drug level for that fraction is about 9.8 micrograms per mil. Even with antibody titers at 20, 22 is where our cutoff is, 22 to 200, really it doesn't hit the, mean, the drug level much. And then as we get the titer is getting higher at 200 to about 1,000, that's when it you know, began to see some impact on the free drug level. And then by the time the titer is in the thousands, uh, it's also, you know, it's really making a difference. Um, also, if you look at the percent of undetectable drug levels uh, in these fractions, um, it makes sense that the undetectable drug level goes up with increasing titer. So hopefully these kind of information will help uh, clinician make better uh, decisions. So I want to share with you a couple of uh, case studies. Um, so this patient was a young patient who was a Crohn's disease that had a family history of uh, inflammable, inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, she was, um, you know, recent flare resulted patient in hospitalization. And um, for whatever reason, mother insisted on adalumumab therapy. Really what's optimal is uh, um, infleximab infusion when someone is um, have a acute flare. Um, so anyways, um, you know, our test result was drug level was undetectable, uh, antibody was undetectable, um, and then we, we had a call to please repeat because this doesn't make any sense. We comply, result was the same, and um, so the half-life of the drug is quite long. So what happened? What's going on? We infused the patient. Where is the drug? So this was tested about uh, five days later. So basically, during flare, 
you know, dr drug could be clear rapidly through GI tract, and that's what was happening to this patient. So, uh, you know, when, when, when I was speaking with the physician, why don't we take some more recent samples and really look at the PK course of what's happening? And we were able to um, see the drugs, but um, so that, that, that kind of thing could happen. Um, So there are, you know, inter-individual differences in how long the drug can last. So typically when someone is in bad flare, um, they infuse much higher dose, much frequent dose, and um, really the, the measuring uh, tr trough level at that stage is really um, not applicable. And then these are another example where there were a 52-year-old male patient with 15 years of history of uh, type 2 diabetes. Um, he was already um, having a lot of um, problems associated with diabetes uh, and also had a recent uh, gastric bypass surgery. Uh, you know, he was on oral diabetic and insulin therapy as well. Um, but he was having a lot of seizure with a glucose level dipping to 30 to 40. Um, and so the, this patient was in a large academic hospital. Uh, they was trying to explain, uh, you know, they measure insulin level. Insulin level was very low. Uh, they look for hem interference. I mean, when it's low, it really doesn't apply, but they were looking for hook effect. They're basically trying to figure out why insulin is not high enough, that it doesn't explain glucose levels. So they were doing imaging to rule out uh, insulin-producing um, uh, tumor. Nothing explained. So they sent the sample to us. Um, it was many, many testing later, but summary is that in, in, during uh, euglycemic state, the free insulin, the insulin, uh, antibody unbound insulin was normal level, whereas total was very high. So majority of this patient insulin was bound by uh, autoantibodies to insulin. In a hypoglycemic state draw, free insulin basically was uh, jumped to very, very high level. Uh, basically, all total insulin was released as a free insulin, and antibody to insulin was very high as well in this patient. So there are two things I just want to highlight, that patient was on a high level of insulin therapy to control his type 2 diabetes. He had autoantibodies to insulin, so most of it was being bound. But under uh, stressful conditions, this, you know, they could dissociate, and that was what was causing uh, the dipping of the glucose there. So you know, the problem with that was the insulin that the, the hospital lab is employing did not pick up the uh, exogenous insulin. So uh, in summary, really, the, uh, based on the biologic drug sales um, and what's in the pipeline, um, the, the biotherapeutic drug will continue to grow and dominate therapy and really need to develop um, accurate tests in the clinic uh, is still not met. And um, we're trying to do collaborate with the pharma and diagnostic companies should collaborate to really launch the drug and clinical test at the same time. Um, and it's good for uh, you know pharmaceutical company to uh, have a means of um, uh, uh, measuring post market surveillance of the, the, uh, the patients that are being treated. And um, this allows for treatment optimization in the clinic, having a test available. And then uh, they're sorely needed is the test standardization because uh, there isn't too many choices in the United States right now uh, to be able to send uh, biologic testing. Um, there are a lot more in Europe, but um, we need to uh, standardize these efforts. And um, last but not least is the, these are very complicated treatments and um, test results could be quite confusing to interpret. So, uh, you know, we really need to educate, educate the users on, you know, how to um, treat the patient as well as how to interpret these tests that are available. Thank you.